On behalf of the University of Arizona, I want to welcome you to the Phoenix Bioscience Corps and to the University of Arizona Health Sciences. My name is Kevin Lohenry, and I'm currently serving as the interim dean for the newly approved College of Health Sciences here at the university. On a personal note, my family recently moved to Tucson from the valley, and we raised our three kids in the valley, so it's great to be back to Phoenix. I recall when the University of Arizona began to start to develop a presence, a stronger presence here in the city. I was leading a health sciences program at a local private university in town, and there were several outstanding faculty that left that university to come here and teach in the College of Medicine Phoenix, who are still here today teaching our next generation of physicians. We also have our Arkan Coit College of Pharmacy, which has over 300 students, faculty, and staff here on this campus. The Zuckerman College of Public Health, which includes about 70 students. We have the College of Nursing teaching their BSN program at our Gilbert campus. And now the new College of Health Sciences, which has about 40 students in our clinical translational research program, our clinical translational sciences program. These students, who are medical students, PhD and graduate students, are learning about translational research and how to apply it in the practice of clinical medicine. So it's a critically important field to us continuing to grow and find individualized solutions to patients' healthcare challenges. The newest planned addition on this campus is the Center for Advanced Molecular Immunological Therapies, or CAMI for short, because that's a very long name. And CAMI is where the future of healthcare will be impacted by the work done right here in the city. Our institution's strength in basic science, translational research, and clinical trials will allow the center to thrive and become a national leader in advancing immunotherapeutic breakthroughs here in the city. The long-term commitment from the University of Arizona here in the Valley is evident by the continued development of the healthcare team that we are all experiencing at some point in time in our life, and it will continue to grow with the future work from CAMI. I would also like to thank Joan Kerber Walker, her team, and the committee members for the kind invitation to speak with you today. The AZ Bio mission aligns with everything we're doing in the College of Health Sciences. Their focus on advocacy directly reflects what we're trying to do with our healthcare providers to equip them to be able to navigate and advocate for the communities and patients that they see. Their focus on workforce directly aligns with our expansion of the healthcare workforce that we're doing here in the College of Health Sciences and in Health Sciences for Arizona overall. And the educational work they do with the media enhances all of our knowledge and our understanding of the importance of bioscience. I thought I would take this time to briefly talk about patient safety and team-based care, two things that are near and dear to my heart. In 1990, I was a rescue swimmer with the United States Navy. I flew with a squadron from Point Magoo, California that trained with the Navy SEALs. We were the early version of Uber back then for these elite operators. They would use a very large satellite that's strapped to their back to call us in. We would find their location with a very, like I'm talking the earliest GPS that we had in society, which would get us about within 100 yards of the team. That's how good our phones are these days. And we would pick them up from their mission and bring them back to base safely. On one particular night, we were flying a training mission in the middle of the night with two helicopters full of Navy SEALs in the desert just east of San Diego. My job as the air crewman on the right side of the helicopter was to ensure that the rotor blades coming around the helicopter didn't hit anything when we landed. So I would, on our checklist, which we carried with us on our, on our thigh, I had a, a strapped in thigh checklist. My step was number one, clear the rotors on the right. My colleague on the left side of the helicopter would then clear the rotors on the left and then I had to get on my belly and climb under the helicopter. I was strapped in to look underneath and make sure that we were safe to land. So on this particular mission of two helicopters, the two helicopters were coming in for a landing with the Navy SEALs on both helicopters. The first helicopter made their landing, and then my helicopter coming in, the blades were clear on the right, so the checklist was, was there. The blades were clear on the left. And then when I leaned underneath, I could tell that we were landing the belly of the helicopter on a large rock, and we were going to risk tipping over and crashing. So the command I was trained to give was wave off. I said wave off over the microphone and my headset, and the pilot instinctively pulled the collective and began to fly around again. He came back down around, 
began to land in the exact same spot. Unknowingly, right? It's, we have night vision goggles on. It's a little hard with depth perception, particularly back in the 1990s. And so we went through the checklist again, and I waved him off again. And at that point, he knew I was a rookie air crewman. He had been a flying helicopter for a while. So he pulled up into a hover over the rock. He used a few expletives towards me, and, and he asked my senior flight crewman to go check my work. And sure enough, this senior chief from Alabama scooted over, looked underneath, and said, yes, sir, we would have, we would have crashed. And, and so he did one more time around. I think about that when I think about patient safety because there was a pressure on this pilot in front of the SEALs, you know, this elite team of operators, in front of his peer who was co-pilot on the helicopter, in front of the other pilots in the other helicopter who were probably laughing at us at the time. He had pressure, internal pressure, peer pressure, to land and make the mission start and, and look like it's cool in a movie. And that just didn't happen on that day because we were following the checklist. He did apologize after the fact, which was great. It showed great humility as a leader. But it was an interesting lesson in life that I've always carried with me as a healthcare provider and an educator. Dr. Atul Gawande uses this same kind of example in life with his book, The Checklist Manifesto, where he took his observational skills as a surgeon and as a licensed pilot, and he began to recognize that patient safety and medical errors were occurring at significant rates, and he felt that was largely due to silos in our health professions and a lack of respect and, and, and communication among all the members of the healthcare team. So he suggested the use of a checklist in many of the things that we accomplish in healthcare to carefully avoid the steps that can cause errors and in fact create a process towards safety. One of those is really about interprofessional education. Healthcare is a team sport. It's led by physicians in many cases. Sometimes it's led by pharmacists, sometimes it's led by others. It depends on the scope of practice and the expertise of the individual at that moment in time. But ultimately, when we learn with and from each other as healthcare providers, we learn to respect one another and understand the unique roles that we play and how we protect each other and most importantly, protect our patients. When I trained at the University of Toronto in interprofessional education about a decade ago, the Canadians have been doing this for about a decade themselves, so they had a pretty good sense of interprofessionality. And I remember they had a model that had all the healthcare providers linked in a circle around the patient. But as Americans are known to do, we questioned the model because we looked at it and we said, well, where's the line to the patient? Why is the patient not linked by a line in this model, this diagram that somebody had created? And, and we had this long conversation about the, the metaphor of that, in that, you know, while we were progressing as a healthcare continuum in terms of working together more collaboratively and getting out of our silos as healthcare providers, we still weren't engaging with the patient and their families and their communities in the way that we probably should. Today, we have the privilege of hearing from many patients, caregivers, a few providers and students as well. And I suspect we're going to hear the challenges they have experienced in navigating complex problems in our health system. I applaud the courage of our speakers for standing up and sharing their stories, which can be painful to bear. I myself have been on both sides of the white coat, having been a provider for many years and having a, a, a chronic immunologic condition that I had to get solved. So I can relate and, and I can have empathy with you. It is challenging to share our secrets, but it's through that secret telling that we all gain benefits and understanding and become more compassionate and become better healthcare providers and community caregivers as well. It is my sincere hope that the investments being made here in the state through the University of Arizona will impact our health and wellness in new and important ways. Collectively, we can make the world a better place. We can be better advocates. We can educate patients and, and the community about bioscience and truly engage the patients and the family in their health and wellness. Thank you very much.